everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on just transition. Um, we're just going to wait until we have a few more people in the room. So we're just going to give it a couple of minutes as people file in. Welcome everyone who's joining. You can see the numbers are going up. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes just to allow people to, to join. Welcome everyone who's joining. Um, we're just gonna give it a couple of more seconds um, just while people file in. Okay, I think maybe we'll get started. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jenny and I'll be moderating this event today. So this webinar has been organized by Earth Journalism Network, which is a program of the Global Media Development Organization Internews. The Earth Journalism Network, or EJN, has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the environment. And it does this by helping journalists around the world report on climate change, biodiversity and conservation, pollution, and other issues by providing story grants, training fellowships, and other kinds of support. So EJN is a, also a community of more than 14,000 journalists in about 180 countries. If you're not a member yet and you'd like to be one, please visit earthjournalism.net to register. By registering, you'll be the first to hear about our story grants, fellowships, and events like this webinar. In this webinar, we'll be looking at just transition from the perspectives of youth, Indigenous people, and women. And we'll hear from Vicky Iridi, who is a lawyer and youth engagement and green job specialist. Currently, Vicky works as a program manager for the Youth Economic Opportunities 2030 and Making Sense International, but she is also the advisor for the Green Jobs for Youth Pact, governed by UNICEF, the ILO, and UNIP. Our second speaker, Joan Carling, is an Indigenous and human rights activist for, and the executive director for Indigenous Peoples' Rights International. Joan has also served as the Indigenous expert on the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the United Nations Economic and Social Council, as well as the General Secretary of the East, the Asia Indigenous Peoples' Pact. And thirdly, May Fazing Aung, who is a researcher in climate finance at the International Institute for Environment and Development. May's research focuses on designing and delivering climate finance to the least developed countries at different levels of government governance. And she is interested in promoting equitable access to climate finance and supporting community empowerment through climate action. Um, so following our three speakers, um, we'll be opening up to audience questions. So for those of you who are watching this live, if there's something that you'd like to ask our speakers, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box. So we'll be monitoring the Q&A feature, but we will not be monitoring the chat. Um, so please put your questions in the Q&A. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to rewatch or catch any parts that you've missed on the website in the next few days. And attendees will also receive an email to rewatch. Um, so before we dive into the presentations themselves, we'll begin with a brief introduction into Just Transition, its principles and history. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass on to May for this section. Hi everyone, thank you for joining the discussion. Let me first share my screen. 
And I'll give you a little introduction about this transition. Great. So I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thanks, Jenny, for the introduction. My name is Meita Zeao, and I am a researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development, which is based in London. Um, I'm originally from Myanmar, and so I'm very pleased to see some people from Southeast Asia joining in. Thank you for making the time in the evening. So what is Just Transition? You might already be familiar with the term because you joined this webinar. Um, before we dive into the definition of a just transition, let's talk about climate justice and the context of just transition within the context of climate justice. Um, so I'd like to focus on the polluter pays principle. So within the context of climate justice, it has been polluting countries, developed countries that have been able to industrialize and develop um, and emit greenhouse gases that has contributed to climate change and climate impacts. And it's a lot of um, countries in the global south that have experienced the impacts of climate change and are experiencing the impacts of climate change the most. So within this context, a just transition is about trying to recognizing um, the contributions of developed countries to climate change, but also working together as, as a global community to move towards a low carbon economy and sustainable development. So while the term just transition has been thrown a lot, around a lot and coming into uh, mainstream media discussions a lot more, there's no defined uh, definition um, or agreed on definition of what a just transition is. Um, and I have these two quotes from the ILO, the International Labour Organization and the Paris Agreement preamble here. Um, and as you can see, these two quotes show that the just transition is very much focused on uh, labour issues. So the ILO defines a just transition as greening, greening the economy in a way that is fair and inclusive as possible to everyone concerned, creating decent job, op, decent work opportunities and leaving no one behind. And in the Paris Agreement preamble, it says that taking into a just transition is about taking into account the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined uh, development priorities. So as you can see, it's a very workforce labor uh, focus definition of the term just transition. But we'll probably talk about this more uh, within the panel discussion. The just transition is beyond uh, just labor issues and um, workforce issues. A little bit about the history of the term also. So it's very much rooted um, to trade unions actually in the United States. And a just transition is not uh, rooted in environmentalism at all. The term actually came about in the 90s when um, workers were protesting against environmental regulations for fear that they were losing their jobs because of stricter environmental standards. And to date, Just Transitions have, has been very much energy sector focused and focused on the loss of fossil fuel jobs, like mining jobs, for example, and very, very northern centric. And to date, very focused on countries that have um, undergone massive changes in um, their energy portfolios from more fossil fuel focused um, energy portfolios to more renewable energy focused portfolios. So I think in our discussion today, we will be talking more about expanding the, the scope of what a just transition is to go beyond the energy, energy sector focus, beyond just work workforce focus, and have a more of a discussion around what does justice really mean within the context that we are working in and how do we enable more transformative change um, that is more inclusive of everybody's perspectives and ensures that no one is left behind as we develop to a more green and sustainable future. 
So I'll leave it at that and hand it back to Jenny so that we can kick off the discussion. Thanks everyone. Thank you, May. Thank you so much for that comprehensive introduction into Just Transition. Um, so now we'll turn it over to our first speaker. So over to you, Vicky. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you, May, for that introduction. I think it's also a good segue to what I'll share. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Vicky Aridi. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. So excited to see some Kenyans in the chat. And I'd like to thank Internews Earth Journalism Network for organizing this discussion. As Jenny mentioned, I work as a program manager for YU 2030 initiative, where we unite young people and the global ecosystem to maximize decent youth employment, SDG 8 by 2030. And the other hat I wear is an advisor of the Green Jobs for Youth Pact by UNICEF, ILO, and UNEP. Now, I'm very excited today to be able to discuss about the youth movement, really towards a just transition. And before I get started, um, I'd like us all to reflect for a moment of two. Um, how many of us here can name at least two youth activists or advocates on climate action from your country? Feel free to drop them in the chat or reflect. I'm sure there's some names that are flying through your head. And for those who can name a few, that shows that young people are actually leading the charge and engage when we talk about a just transition. And if you didn't, maybe this discussion is what you need to just kickstart your next story. So today we'll really look at three parts, even as we look at how youth are engaged within the just transition, looking at what may shared on what really is the just transition and green recovery and where are the young people People. And what are some tips and tricks to integrate youth into our stories when we're talking about just transition and the green recovery? So I'll bring up my screen. Let me know when you can see my slides. Can you see them? Yes, I can see them, Vicky. Yeah, they're not in presentation mode, but we can see them. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. So building up on the definition may shared from the ILO, really two things I want to emphasize, creating decent youth employment opportunities and inclusive. So really just transition is really about including everyone, including the young people who are a key demographic. And so when we talk about the just transition, we can't talk about it without including young people as key stakeholders. Then another definition that is key when we're talking about the just transition is the green recovery. And what really is this? These are different economic recovery measures that are put in place to ensure that we achieve our long-term climate change and sustainability objectives that will bring us one step closer towards a model for our economies and really our planet that is resilient and inclusive. So if you leave with nothing else from this webinar, just remember that when you're talking about the just transition, an inclusive approach is key and the green recovery is those measures that we're putting in place towards long-term climate change. Now, really talking about the million dollar question, where are the young people? So I have a short clip that I'm just going to share and I'll play for a few minutes. Let me know when you can hear it. I'm sharing my windows. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen, Jenny? Yes, we can see it, yeah. Perfect. Can you hear? Yes, we can also hear, yeah. <laughs> Dear grandmother, I turned 18 and finally mom gave me your letter. Even though you're no longer here, I wanted to write back to you. Mom has told me a lot about you, that you used to live in a beautiful house by the beach, that your family owned a thriving fish shop, that you used to love running in the open air. All this is gone now. 
Like so many others, our family had to leave that coastal town because of the frequent storms. The sea levels rose and engulfed your house, our family home. Fishing was no longer a livelihood for them. We now live in the interior part of the country. Some days, the heat is unbearable. Because of the frequent droughts, I spend most days walking to find water with other girls. I know how much you and your fellow girl activists support climate change so this would never happen. Sorry for the bad news. I'm so proud of you anyway. To my future granddaughter, I am 18 years old today, and it will be many years before you are born. But I've been thinking a lot about the world we live in and how it will look like if we don't act now. At this point in time, we shouldn't have to be explaining the impacts of the climate crisis. We should be asking you about solutions. We stopped going to school on Fridays. Instead, we designed a plan. My friend Jenny and I have been promoting laws and policies to protect farming, fishing, pastoralist, and nomadic communities. Shahina and Bami Del are developing lesson plans to educate other young women and girls about climate resilience. Dia and Lee are advocating for more investment in youth-led organizations and trainings for women, girls, and youth to access green jobs. Asa and Maria are working to ensure that everyone has equal access to water services. We will keep fighting and holding leaders and corporations accountable for our future. I think I'll stop there. And just looking at that video, it's already beginning to speak to how young people are in fact and indeed already contributing towards the just transition. When you look at the video, it was showing how young people are already leading through advocacy. We have young people taking action and using their voices to move stakeholders to contribute their resources and their programs towards a just transition through the famous climate strikes like Fridays of the Future, through their climate movements, through different coalitions, using social media and their podcasts. In fact, there's actually one podcaster by the name Abigail Kima from Kenya, who actually uses her podcast to profile and amplify the stories of young climate activists. And beyond advocacy, young people are also part of the green enterprises, which is a key component of the just transition. When we look at different sectors like the agriculture sector, Young people are implementing climate smart agribusinesses that include dynamic agroforestry and technology. When we look at sustainable fashion, we have young corporations being run by entrepreneurs like in Philippines and in Lebanon, where they are using innovative technology with 3D printed clothing, where they're using eco-friendly materials to be able to develop sustainable fashion. And we cannot talk about green enterprises without looking at how young people are engaged in the just energy transition. Young people are making briquettes as an alternative source of energy, clean energy cook stoves, and training their fellow young people to enable to make these things so that they can have sources of livelihoods. Even looking at the waste management and the circular economy, young people are being engaged to create affordable housing through waste that they have managed, developing smart intelligent solar powered waste bins that can be used for waste management. So a lot is already happening towards a just transition being led by young people in the green enterprises space. Another space young people are also engaging in is decision making and policy. When we think about different negotiations at different levels, young people are feeding into those policy making structures and ensuring that their voices are integrated towards a just transition. And like you saw in the video, two young people are leading a movement 
focused on capacity strengthening of other young leaders so that they can be able to participate in the just transition. Now that answers the question, where are the young people? But challenges are faced as we know it. When we're thinking about integrating young people and their voices into the just transition, we know that there are many bureaucratic structures that bar young people from meaningfully engaging with different policymaking processes in this space. The issue of skilling is another one that young people need to be strengthened their capacity when we talk about this topic. And really, the usual suspects challenge. I know even for us in our stories, we tend to use the same faces and the same um, suspects. How can we diversify that? And then the issue, of course, of non-meaningful youth engagement, looking at young people as mere tokens when we talk about this topic or not seeing the real value they can add. And of course, that brings me to the issue of inclusivity when I, we're thinking about our language. A lot of the resources, stories, and information that we see is usually in the common languages. That's already a barrier to young people who do not speak these languages. How can we integrate their voice? voices more meaningfully. And of course, financial resources to scale their interventions. And what does sex really look like, bearing those challenges in mind? I'll use one example in the interest of time. Through um, Making Sense International, through a project called Kenya Crops and Dairy Market Systems, they were able to build the capacity of over 600 young people around climate resilience and sustainable agri enterprises towards a just transition. And as a result of this program, they were able to scale their enterprises, contribute towards a just transition, and also realize 2.9 million in sales for their produce. Now, just a few tips and tricks to integrate youth voices into your stories as I close. There's a need to diversify and include new youth voices, more so the most marginalized in your stories. Use dignified photos to accompany your stories, not photos that are questionable or photos that don't provide dignity to the young people. Work with organizations already working with young leaders, like Making Sense International, the Green Jobs for Youth Pact, Young Girl. In your stories, protect the young people's future, even as you quote their frustrations. Don't make the future be a detriment to their future and integrate the lessons from their experiences. When you think about that and you implement that, you'll be able to meaningfully integrate youth voices into your stories. I'll share via the chat some two or three topics that you could consider for um, young people and this topic around the just transition. Thank you, Jenny, back to you. Thank you so much, Vicky. That was, that was really insightful. Um, so we're now going to move on to our second speaker. So um, over to you, Joan. Can I share my screen? Yes, go ahead, John. You should should be able to. Okay. Okay. Um. So, good good day to everyone. I will be sharing the perspectives of indigenous peoples in relation to um the energy systems, uh in relation to uh also the climate justice. So, uh. I, I, I will not dwell anymore on the definition of, of a just transition because that was provided earlier. I just want to emphasize what the IPCC uh, mentioned on, on, on this matter uh, in relation to the key elements necessary to achieve a just transition. And they emphasize the role of governments, polluters and, and corporations that they need to to pay for the, the, the transition needed and to provide welfare and safety net and adequate compensation to people and communities that are negatively impacted. So uh, so bringing that on the, on the discussion, I just want to share that from the experience of, of indigenous peoples, it's, it's clear that while indigenous peoples have the lowest carbon footprint because of our um, uh, simple lifestyle, we are at the front line uh, suffering from the consequences of uh, climate change 
and at the same time also becoming victims of the just transition, which I, in the context of indigenous peoples, is an extension of our colonization, and this time it's green colonization. So uh, what, what are the impacts? Uh, first and for foremost is the, the continuation of the violation of our rights, particularly to our lands, territories, and resources leading to massive displacements and forced evictions, as you can see from uh, building of mega dams, because that is, is still considered as clean and renewable energy, uh, the destruction of livelihoods and food systems, including our cultural heritage, and even criminalization and attacks again, against land and environment defenders. When we uh, defend our lands against this kind of impositions, uh, we are criminalized and many of us are, are in jail or even killed um, for, for defending our, our um, rights. Joan, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, would you mind putting your um, presentation on full screen just so people can see it a little better? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, sorry. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So, so these are the, the experiences of indigenous peoples on climate change, including in the just transition, right? Um, and uh, the other is, of course, the, the massive pollution and environmental destruction, and also the increase in violence and abuse against women and undermining uh, the knowledge and roles of women, in indigenous women in resource management and food systems. And, and this is more uh, acute when, when indigenous peoples are forcibly displaced from our lands territories and resources as a consequence of impositions of renewable energy projects. You can see from this, uh, I'm, I'm giving two examples of, of windmill farms that were opposed by indigenous peoples. Uh, one is in Kenya and the other one is in Norway, where uh, the Supreme Courts in both countries upheld that these projects violated the rights of indigenous peoples particularly on land in the case of Kenya. And for the for the case in Norway, it's a violation of uh, the cultural heritage of the Sami people in practicing their uh, reindeer herding as part of their uh, cultural heritage. Uh, we can also see from here the mining of transition minerals uh, in indigenous territories. Uh, the one on the right is the lithium uh, in Chile. Uh, which again uh, did not have the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples. It's another imposition, and nickel uh, mining in the in the Philippines. So in in both you can see the environmental impact, and in many cases, in many cases, environmental impact of mining is almost irreversible. So now going to uh, what what are then the key steps uh, in terms of uh, providing ensuring that the energy system is uh, leading to climate justice. One is that it, we, we need to be clear that the, the, the root causes of climate ju justice should also provide for the solutions. So in this context, the historical responsibility of developed countries, as already presented earlier, uh, should do more. They have because they have the means, they have the the finance, and they have the technology to assist uh, poor countries so that they can still uh, have a, a space to to develop and and shift to uh, low carbon uh, technologies. But at the same time, they need to reduce dramatically their carbon emission. Th that is what the just transition is for. And in, in this context, we need to be clear that uh, uh, there needs to be a, a phase out of the fo of, uh, of extraction of fossil fuel, uh, fossil oil and gas as the main source of, of energy, because that is the one that is causing uh, the, the carbon emission, right? And in, in, in this particular context, it's, it's, uh, it's important that the rich countries uh, shift their subsidy from fossil fuel to renewable energy uh, development, including, for example, developing or uh, uh, subsidizing mass transport systems instead of, for example, supporting e-cars uh, 
or continuing to provide uh, uh, support for the mining industry that is not accountable. So if we look at the figure, there's 7 trillion US subsidies for fossil fuel in 2022, which is 7% of the GDP. It, this demonstrates this clearly demonstrate that it's, it's, it's still this is a major a block in the shift to uh to renewable energy when even the small the, the target for 100 billion per year under the green climate fund is not even met yet the, the finance is there there is enough resources to to make the, the the transition to low low carbon and ensuring so, uh, social equity, but that is not happening because the funds are still continue uh, are are still put into uh, fossil fuel. Then we also need to protect forest and biodiversity as carbon sinks. Uh, but this is just a lip service of many governments because they still consider the carbon as business opportunities. Look at countries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, for example, instead of protecting the forest, they're transforming the forest uh, to, to, uh, to palm oil because that's more business. It brings more money. Uh, to line up the pockets, for example, of, of politicians. So th this is the reality, and these are the obstacles that, that we, we see to make the, the transition uh, more uh, equitable. And then, of course, we also, sorry, oh, oh I want to go back. Um, the, the, the issue, of course, for indigenous peoples is to ensure the recognition and protection of, of our rights, particularly particularly to our lands, territories, and resources, and the need to properly implement the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples in renew renewable energy development, and also ensuring equitable benefit sharing agreements. And this also applies to transition minerals. It's really worrisome now that 53% of the target transition minerals are in indigenous territories. And it's again being imposed on us without even consultation, without our consent, or even without, it's a complete uh, disregard, as if we don't exist, as if the only thing that matters now are the the the, the lithium or, or the, the transition minerals. And, and, and what is more worrying is that governments are now justifying uh, the, the, the extraction of transition minerals in the name of climate change, in the name of recovery from, from COVID. And what they are doing is that they are even suspending, suspending or uh, amending laws. On, on the need for public consultation, on the need to do environmental uh, uh, studies. So, the, the, so they want to fast track this kind of, uh, of uh, activities in the name of just transition. And, and you can just imagine the conflicts, uh, the, the, the attacks on, on in indigenous leaders and, and communities that are defending our, our lands. So, so this, this is something that, that we need to be mindful of. And, and, and I hope there will be more media attention to this uh, growing crisis for indigenous peoples to make our stories more visible that we are actually the stewards and not the destroyers. And it's, it's a whole that it's a different dimension of how do we define social justice in this context when we, as the stewards of nature, are 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 being attacked while all those that are destroying are even compensated because they are providing solution to climate change. I mean that's absurd, completely absurd, uh, and 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 uh, a lot of communities are even are not even aware. Because legally they are, they don't have legal. Uh, rec uh, there's no legal recognition of their lands. So when governments and corporations come and say, "Okay, in the name, we need to do, we need to um, to um, to support the the transition," so we need the uh, the minerals from your land, and you know, just just like that. 
And that's when the criminalization of indigenous peoples also happen, because when, when we defend, then they said, oh, you're violating public property, you're, you're violating uh, national, uh, 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 you're against national development, you're against uh, uh, the just transition. So uh, ju I just want to highlight that as, as a major, major concern for indigenous peoples. And finally, also to mention that we need policy coherence uh, uh, on, in the, uh, on the protection of human rights for social equity and accountability and the sustainability of, of environment, right? In many countries, they say they protect the environment, but at the same time allow the destruction of the environment by mining companies or segregation of, of, of indigenous lands and conservation areas and evicting indigenous peoples. There's just no policy coherence. And what is being uh, implemented are more those that are supporting the interest of the few. Of, of, of business, for example. So we need to ensure that there is policy uh, coherence uh, along this. Uh, and if we want to, to, uh, to uh, ensure climate justice. And finally, just to also say that we need to ensure access to renewable energy by indigenous communities. We are hosting a lot of energy projects and yet we're not getting the energy. It's going to business, it's all to, to urban areas, but not for indigenous peoples whose resources are being used for such projects. Uh, the, the workers' rights was already mentioned. And again, the, the issue of environmental sustainability is, a, is, a, is should be at the center when we're talking of the transition minerals, mining for transition minerals. And, and, and to ensure that we need mandatory standards and regulations for mining companies uh, in terms of ensuring social equity and that they, may, they should be held into account, polluters pay and whatever uh, impacts to human rights that uh, of their operations should, uh, should not be uh, tolerated. And finally, ensuring citizens' participation and empowerment, uh, that we are not just victims, we are part, we are actors, we are driving solutions uh, uh, to, to achieve uh, climate justice. So I just want to show uh, some of, of the initiatives of indigenous peoples um, of bringing uh, community-based renewable energy. The one uh, the, uh, on, on the pictures are, are the uh, efforts of the Right Energy Partnership led by indigenous peoples in partnership with the UNDP. Uh, th these are in, in Africa. Uh, there are several projects like this. And uh, and also this uh, uh, micro hydro. Uh, this is in 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 Malaysia, where these are the kind of projects that are actually reaching uh, indigenous uh, communities and it's indigenous peoples leading the the solutions. But one of the of the equitable uh, that that there there is also an equitable terms for. Uh, for the just transition uh, that we see in the in the experience of, of Canada, where the indigenous clean energy, which is an indigenous uh, led um, company, is providing a solution of uh, uh, renewable energy in indigenous territories in partnership with the government and also with the private sector. But the way they operate, the way they operate is completely different from others because they ensure that part of their framework is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that they respect that. And when they, they work with communities, they always have the leaders and elders, they consult them first of what are the possible sites so that the, the sacred sites will not be touched. And certain if certain ceremonies has to be done, they will do it. So the ones taking the decision are the communities and they are the ones implementing technically and providing the necessary support for indigenous communities to have access. So this is, is, a, is a pathway for providing um, uh, renewable energy for indigenous peoples that is uh, based on social equity and respect for our rights. 
So finally, just to conclude uh, that the just transition is not only about green jobs, low carbon technologies and finance, but more importantly is on the structural transformation of the global energy system based on historical responsibility, accountability that have caused the climate crisis, policy coherence on, and practice on the respect and protection of human rights, social equity and empowerment, of those that are impacted disproportionately, uh, such as poor countries and marginalized sectors and communities, and sustainability of the environment in order to achieve climate justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. That was, yeah, very interesting and some really shocking statistics there about where funding goes. And yeah, definitely interesting for our journalists to maybe think about um, some investigative journalism into that. Um, um, and everyone yet, yeah, remember, if you have any questions for Joan, please do pop them in the Q&A. We can see some coming through. Um, and so we're going to pass now to our third and final speaker. Um, so May, over to you. All right, thank you everyone for sticking around. Joan, screen. And Joan, would you mind? doing uh stopping your oh. share screen so i can share sorry <laughs> no worries uh, uh how do i do that again uh wait uh uh where is it it should be at the top of your screen there should be an option to stop sharing stop there we uh, go yeah okay perfect okay. Done? sorry yes it's working now no problem at all Okay, so um, I think that Vicky and Joan have already talked a lot about what I'm going to talk about, um, which is about uh, considering gender justice in your angle of reporting. The greater picture to consider, as Joan already mentioned, is where is the justice in the reduction of emissions by the polluter? Are they significantly and transformatively moving towards justice as they reduce emissions. And you have to also question the transition intervention itself. Is the low carbon economy actually more equitable and more just for people of different backgrounds? Is green growth actually more just and equitable? So those are the things that you should keep in the back of your mind as you're thinking about just transitions. So I'll talk a little bit about what gender justice is. Um, and how you can apply it in your in in your work. So, gender justice is thinking about inclusion and considering who would be affected. So, as Vicky already spoke about, youth are major actors in climate justice movement, and they their perspectives should be considered, uh, as well as indigenous peoples who are going to be very, very important actors, not only in the transition process, but also as um, stewards of the land where minerals for green growth, renewable energy development. So think about this. The next thing to consider is why. Why are the people that are being affected not able to achieve justice? Why are they experiencing injustice. So in thinking about who, uh, I'll talk about a couple of societal shifts that are happening right now. Uh, it might be a bit noisy, some people moving through the room. Um, so I'll just speak a little louder. So uh, I think a lot of you are already following societal shifts in the work that you do. Um, and these societal shifts are uh, things that are happening in our society and causing massive transformation, massive changes in gender roles, massive changes in the way that we work and operate. So, for example, these are technological shifts, the rise of artificial intelligence in the way that we work. And when you're thinking of the rise of artificial intelligence, think of whose jobs it is that will be displaced by the rise of AI and who will be the most uh, sidelined in the development of AI. We've already experienced huge changes into our society because of the pandemic, where we 
experience remote working and gender roles have changed because of the changes in the way that we work, the passions at which we work. Are there any people that are going to be marginalized and sidelines as a result of these changes? There are also technological changes. So as we move to a more, more low carbon future, there's a need for more skilled labor um, in renewable in the renewable energy sector, for example. Do we have enough women and people from marginalized groups that can take up the skilled jobs? And I saw a question in the chat about can our youth equipped to take up some of these skilled jobs? Um, and are we as a society able to support them in the taking up of these skilled jobs? So as you think of who it is uh, in considering justice, think of who will be sidelines and what kind of support they would need in order to take up and occupy um, a role in a more just society. And I know a lot of you are journalists from the global south and uh, I myself am from the global south, I'm from Myanmar and Global North interventions are not going to work in the Global South. As I mentioned before, the, globe, the Global North, the term just transitions um, is very much a Global North um, term. And this term was proposed by trade unions um, where um, they fought for the rights of workers. And we don't have that in the Global South so much where our labor is characterized by informal workers, people working as smallholder farmers, people working um, in informal jobs, working in artisanal mines, um, working in transportation, and they're not covered as welfare by the government. And so while in the global north, interventions have focused on compensation of workers that have lost their jobs, in our societies, in the global south, those kinds of interventions will not work. So we need to design very context specific interventions that work for our economies, our society, and the roles that we have uh, as women, as youth in the, in the societies that we operate in. It's also important in thinking of gender justice to think of the role of informality and the role of care. So these are, Informality I mentioned is um, workers, for example, that are not covered working formally. Um, and the role of care is important because women work um, at home, have a very domestic role, and it takes up a lot of time to care for the household, have domestic responsibilities. And these things uh, prevent a lot of women from attaining education, from working in formal jobs and working, being part of the new just transition green economy society. And so the role of care needs to be recognized and the role of care needs to be supported. Um, I think um, we're running out of time. So I will skip to um, suggestions that I have for you in thinking about how to report on just transitions. So in thinking about reporting on just transitions, think about what is a just transition to your community in the environment that you work in, in the constituents that you report for. What does a just transition look like? And we can't even use the term just transition in the global south because it's a term that's not recognized by by most of the context within where we work. So you have to take it upon yourself to understand what justice looks like in your community. And think of interventions also. How will interventions work within your country context? Will worker compensation work for you? I know that in South Africa, there's a very uh, robust process supported by the Global North to support South Africans in developing an inclusive just transition consultative process. Will a similar process work in the country context that you're working in? 
a very inclusive process that tries to consult with different groups of people within the country. I know it has its flaws, but is that process going to work with the new country context? And lastly and finally, question the green development. It needs to be just, and just because it's green development, it's not necessarily going to be just for the most marginalized communities. So I'll leave it there and we can go into Q&A. Thank you. And sorry for the noise. Thank you so much, May. Yes. Um, so yeah, we have some time now for some Q&As. We've had some um, come in the chat, which is great. So I will try to maybe ask each speaker one question. Um, and so let's start with um, perhaps a question for Joan. Um, so there's been a question about, um, specifically about um, the Philippine government promoting hydropower as part of the transition towards renewable energy. Um, and so the question is, is this a sound strategy to cut carbon emissions? Not in the context of it violating the, the rights uh, of, of indigenous peoples and also in relation to the environmental impact of, of uh, large dams. We, we've seen this already. We've seen that, that, that it's actually causing flooding uh, in, in, in the lowlands. And, and the ones that are benefiting from this kind of projects are not the farmers. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the one that built this kind of projects. And, and those are the lessons that we need to learn. If we are to achieve a sustainable energy development, we need to learn from the experience in the past of the, it's a legacy of oppression, of exploitation, of human rights violations, of killings and attacks. And yet that is being ignored and now justified in the name of, of, of green transition. So definitely that is not the solution. We need to find other ways that is more uh, 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 environment friendly, but equally important is the issue of social justice. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Joan. Um, we've had a question um, for Vicky. So um, about how diverse Africa is in terms of socioeconomics and everything, how do how do we kind of like um, make sure that each it's appropriate for each country over such a vast geographical space? Um, do you have any kind of examples of how a just transition principle has been more kind of personalized? Thank you, Jenny. I saw there were a lot of questions around that and also on youth engagement. So I'll try to make sure I answer both. So the first one, when you look at Africa, and I also speak from my experience, every country is, is different. So when you're talking about a just transition, it's not one shoe fits all. I'll give the example of, and, and using different examples, if you look at the Southern Africa region, earlier this year, they were hit by um, tropical cyclone Freddy, which really pushed them backwards towards their plans towards a just transition. Then you have countries like Kenya who are more focused on reforestation programs and really um, greening the economy through um, adoption of forestries and the like. So when a country is developing their, their plans in line with, with the just transition, it's really looking at, okay, these are the socioeconomic conditions in, the, in my country. For instance, my country is susceptible to cyclones or susceptible to this. So in line with that, really developing a plan that will address that. Number two, what are the resources available? Remember, just transition, advancing a just transition also competes with other priorities. So based on the national budgets available, countries usually say, how much are we willing to allocate that towards a just transition? And will a just transition help us to achieve other goals. So for instance, if it proves that the just transition will contribute to employment, then they're likely to say we'll put a significant amount towards that to contribute towards that. So it's also a balance of that, just to touch on that very briefly. Then the second, there was a question on how do we skill young people um, for the future? And 
One thing, an interesting resource that might be interesting to look at is LinkedIn developed a green skills global graph report that shows kind of the different skills that young people and different stakeholders require when we're talking about a just transition. So that is an integral resource that helps, that can even help different countries know what skills are needed. And then there's also been a movement by UNEP to create the Green Universities Network and UNESCO has developed um, the Green TVET um, movement and curriculum, which provides some guidelines that tertiary and vocational training institutions can use to be able to green their curriculums. So apart from that, there's also that aspect of using um, low carbon accelerator hubs in country to be able to work with young entrepreneurs and innovators to provide them with skills and at the local level with grassroots and CSO organizations on the same. I know there's a third question, but in the interest of time, I'll answer live via the Q&A. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I'll just ask May our final question, um, just in the interest of time. Um, so there's a question about the existing inequalities that already exist in terms of gender. And so what are some strategies or approaches that we can use when kind of facing resistance um, to yeah, these already existing prejudices? I thank you for asking the question. I didn't get to touch on this so much. But I think the barriers are uh, capitalism <laughs> and extractivism that we continue to rely on in order to fuel our economies. And if these existing paradigms, we don't change these business as usual models, we will continue to have colonialization, green colonialization, as Joan was talking about, and also historical colonialization that has affected the governance structure of our societies created ethnic tensions, created environmental degradation in, in the global south that really need to be questioned. Um, but I don't, it, th these are huge problems. And I think we can only chip away at them through different interventions. And I, I really like Vicky's very positive example because you show that youth can, uh, and, and Joan's example. So how there are already uh, people on the ground that are doing what they can to make a change in our society. And I think we need to see more of those, scale up more of those. Um, and I, I think that in the global South, there women, marginalized communities of all backgrounds have managed to thrive on so few resources. And if we can find a way to harness that in innovation and support entrepreneurship of use of different groups of people, uh, we can really try to chip away at some of the norms around why uh, some of the norms around women's use, indigenous people. Uh, I also think that there needs to be more investment in social capital and that social networks are really, really powerful in sharing knowledge, resources and information. And these need to be, um, yeah, these need to be supported in order for different marginalized groups to be empowered and become more um, involved in decision making and knowledge sharing. Thanks. Thank you, May. Thank you, May. That's wonderful. Um, so we are approaching the end. It's nearly time to wrap up. So um, what I'd love to do is just go to all of our speakers to get a final reflection or a comment on the topic before we go. Um, we'll also be pasting a link to the feedback survey in the chat. So we'd love to know from all of you if you enjoyed the webinar, if you have any suggestions for future events. Um, so that would be great if you could take some time to fill that out. Um, in terms of final reflections, I will start with you, Vicky. Thank you, Jenny. Maybe just a final in reflection would be some potential topics to consider when thinking about integrating youth voice into the just transition. And I'll just share three that I dropped in the chat. One really around inclusion of young people with disabilities in the just transition, which we don't see enough of. And then lessons from youth in their involvement in advancing a just transition rather than just 
focusing on the glamorous story, but what are the real, raw, concrete lessons? And really, how do we meaningfully include and engage youth who are not a homogeneous group as key stakeholders when we're talking about advancing a green recovery and using a, an article like that to bring in diverse perspectives so that it's a con intergenerational conversation towards that. And really, even as you amplify your stories, ensure that young people's perspectives are front and center. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Joan, any final comments from you? Yeah, um, just to add uh, that I, I think uh, what we're, we're not yet uh, seeing the real picture of what's happening in the in this so-called uh, just transition and how green colonization is actually happening on the ground so it it would be good if more stories are coming out on 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 the situation on the ground and how uh, the just transition is being justified to cause oppression and and all these attacks on on environment defenders on indigenous peoples uh, those are the real stories that that needs to come out we're talking here of justice and we need to demonstrate that 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 that, that, that it's becoming uh, another way of of again uh, continuing the same kind of uh, structural um, oppression that that marginalized communities and indigenous peoples are experiencing but at the same time while we highlight this we also need to show the solutions that we are providing we are acting on these issues we're not just passive we're not just victims we are are the ones driving the real solutions and we need to be part of the decision making we we need to and we and we have to make those uh those that are driving this uh unsustainable uh practices to be accountable we need to have a strong voice to raise uh, demand accountability polluters pay uh, may, uh, uh leave uh the the minerals on the ground and let's act together in the spirit of solidarity global solidarity this that is what we need to drive action thank you thank you joan yes i can see someone posted that they got some inspiration for some stories so that's wonderful um and May, your final reflections and comments. So I also want to encourage all of you to tell stories and lived experiences as part of evidence. Evidence is only considered scientific um, and storytelling is not considered real evidence because it's a colonized form of knowledge and we need to change that paradigm and I that's why I, I really encourage the use of the decolonization perspective because that has shaped the way we credit and value certain stories over the others and so I really want you to tell more stories because that is the evidence that we need and as journalists, you have the power in your hand to tell stories. So please continue to do that. Wonderful. Thank you, May. Um, so we are at the end um, of our time for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. Um, as a reminder, you will receive a link to the webinar recording via email in the next few days, which will also include the speaker presentations and contact information. Uh, we'd also please ask you to fill out the survey in the chat. Um, just for some feedback on this event. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for joining and have a wonderful day. Thank you.